Okay, so welcome everybody to this new DASI seminar. Today, it's my great, great pleasure to introduce Professor Carlos Gómez from the University of A Coruña. Since 2018, he is the coordinator of the Innova Humanitas area, whose objective is to work at the intersection between technology and humanities. His research focuses on the field of computational linguistics, especially syntactic analysis and opinion mining, having published more than 140 peer review publications. He was the principal investigator of the ERC starting grant Fast Parse, and is currently the principal investigator of an ERC proof of concept devoted to syntactic analysis for large scale sentiment analysis. Uh, last year, he received the Maria Andresa Casamayor National Research Award, the highest recognition of the Spanish Ministry of Science for young researchers in mathematics and information and communication technologies. And he was also recognized as an honorary member of the Royal Spanish Mathematical Society. I want to thank Professor Gomez for very kindly accepting our invitation. And whenever you are ready, the floor is all yours. Hey, uh, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, uh, thanks a lot for, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here giving this talk which I hope is of your interest. I'm going to talk about simple efficient parsing with sequence labeling. So basically I'm going to introduce a new parsing paradigm that we have been developing during the last five years or so, uh, and th that makes syntactic analysis faster uh, and simpler than with previous approaches. So I'm going to start by motivating and introducing what we are going to do. And then I will explain the details and how to ap they apply uh, to the two main types of uh, syntactic grammars, which are constituent grammars and dependency grammars. And then I will summarize some conclusions. So to start, uh, what is this syntactic parsing I'm talking about? Well, um, this is within the field of natural language processing, where our main goal is to create programs that can communicate with us in human languages, which means both understanding and generating human language. And one key task in natural language processing is what we call parsing or, or syntactic parsing, which consists in obtaining the internal structure of sentences, the hierarchical structure of sentences. Uh, this structure can be represented in several ways, depending on what grammatical theory you're following. One is what we call constituent parsing, which is the, uh, the theory that we typically see at, at school and no one tells us what it's for, right? Um, in this uh, theory, syntax is represented by dividing the sentence recursively into constituents, which are in turn divided into smaller constituents. And then an, an alternative is dependency parsing, where the structure of the sentence is represented by binary relations between words that are called dependencies. Each of these relations goes from a, what we call a head word or parent to a dependent word or child. So what is the point of all this? What is uh, it useful for? Well, the point is that parsing is very useful if you want to extract semantics from the natural language text. Uh, suppose that we have a model that needs to know what this sentence, young A. the apple, is about. What's happening there? Well, uh, for example, in this dependency tree, you can see that the main verb, the root, is ate. So someone ate something. Uh, who ate something? The subject, right? There is a, here a dependency, a an arrow from eight to young, which says that young is a subject of eight. So that's a person who ate. And what was eaten? the direct object, right? We go to the object dependency and we find the apple. So as you can see, uh, syntax can be seen as a step towards uh, semantics. This is why it's useful in a wide range of, uh, of natural language tasks, for example, uh, automatic summarization, machine translation, sentiment analysis, and many other tasks that involve understanding language. Uh, so, the situation when we started developing this paradigm of parsing with sequence labeling that I'm going to talk about a few years ago, like five years ago, we had parsing algorithms that were accurate. So they obtained sufficient accuracy to be useful for uh, real applications, but they were too slow. 
they processed maybe uh, accurate parsers at that point processed maybe 10 sentences per second, which made them infeasible for real life large scale applications, unless you had huge amounts of computational power. And apart from that, parsers were uh, difficult to use because they required ad hoc algorithms, algorithms specific to parsing, creating a large barrier to entry. And because their outputs were like trees like this, which um, are relatively difficult to handle and to integrate into downstream tasks. Normally, most NLP systems are used to dealing with sequences and not with hierarchical output. Uh, so what I will present is an approach that has uh, solved these challenges by reducing parsing to uh, what we call a sequence labeling task. Uh, so what's the meaning of that? What is sequence labeling? Well, uh, sequence labeling, also called token classification, is a generic machine learning task. You could call it a design pattern in machine learning in the sense that it's uh, like a template that we can apply to different uh, problems. Uh, and it goes like this. It's given a, a sequence, the input is a sequence, uh, a sequence of anything. In, in natural language processing, typically it's a sequence of words, but it could be of anything. And the output is one discrete label for each element of the sequence. So uh, an example of how this task can be applied is what we call part of speech tagging. Part of speech tagging is a task of taking a sentence and assigning to each word its uh, morphosyntactic category, its grammatical category. For example, identifying that in this sentence here, um, join is a verb, right? IBM is a proper noun and board is a noun. So can we identify adjectives, uh, adverbs. That's part of speech tagging, okay? Uh, you see that this task uh, fits the pattern of sequence labeling that I just defined because the input is a sequence, in this case, a sequence of words, and the output is one label per, per word, okay? And the labels come from a discrete set. There is a finite set of uh, grammatical categories. Uh, the thing is that this uh, pattern, this uh, template cannot only be used for um, part of speech tagging, but also for many other tasks. For example, here you see an example for MP chunking and name entity recognition, which are tasks that um, locate uh, substrings of a sentence. Okay? In MP chunking, the goal is to locate the noun phrases in a sentence, in this case, Pierre Vinken and IBM Sport. And in uh, name identity recognition, the goal is to locate uh, proper names, which could be single words or could span multiple words, in this case, Pierre Vinken and IBM. Okay? And these tasks are solved within the sequence labeling paradigm by means of, of an encoding called IOB tagging. Uh, where the outputs are tags of the form B, I, and O, such that B means that a given token, a given word, is at the beginning of a, sorry, of a span, in this case of a noun phrase. Okay? Uh, I means that a given word is inside a span, but not at the beginning, and O means that a given word is outside uh, any span. It doesn't belong to any span. So with these three tags, uh, you can locate all the spans, uh, and this can be uh, used for, as you can see here, for MP chunking, name identity recognition, and other, many other span detection tasks. For example, it could be used for abusive language detection. Okay, so it's a, uh, as you can see, uh, sequence labeling is like a generic tool that, that you can apply to many things. So the advantages of this is that you can have an off-the-shelf system trained to perform sequence labeling, and you can apply the very same system without adaptation to different tasks. You, you only need, of course, to train the system on, on a data set related to your task, but the architecture is the same. You don't need any ad hoc algorithms. The same uh, neural network that you train for name entity recognition is also valid for part of speech tagging, for example. And if, if someone improves the overlay, uh, the underlying architecture, if the system that you're using improves, you are imp improving in all tasks. Okay, so you take advantage of improvements in all tasks. Um, it's also easy to integrate 
uh, several tasks. For example, imagine that you can uh, you want to perform MP chunking and also named entity recognition. Well, you could just plug the tags from MP chunking as inputs to the named entity recognition sequence uh, labeling system, right? Or you could even do multitask learning. You could train your sequence uh, labeling neural network to generate both kind, both kinds of tasks at the same time in such a way that ones benefit from the others. Okay. So as you can see, formulating a task, a uh, sequence labeling has a, a host of advantages, but the problem with syntactic parsing is that it's not so easy to represent in this way because it does not come naturally as a tagging problem, as a labeling problem, like part of speech tagging, because the outputs are hierarchical trees and not sequences of labels. Uh, it's not also represented naturally as a spam detection problem, like name, name identity recognition. Uh, so then what, what's, uh, what's the way of, of representing parsing a sequence labeling? Well, the, the solution that we found is to create encoding functions that uh, are able to represent a syntactic tree as a sequence of labels. So we are going to encode a tree to a sequence of labels. It's important to take into account that for it to be sequence labeling, we need to encode the tree exactly as one label per word, not more. And I say this because traditionally, trees have been represented, uh, represented as parenthesized uh, strings, right? Where you, for example, have one node, you open parentheses, and then you have the left child, right child, close parentheses. But with this, you generate more labels and you have words, so it's not valid. Okay, we need encodings with exactly one label per word. So how do we do this? Let's see, okay? And for this purpose, I'm going to divide the talk into constituent parsing and dependency parsing. So in constituent parsing, let's first see what, what we want to do. In constituent parsing, the output, our output is a tree headed by a node labeled S, which is uh, the root of the tree or initial symbol. The S st uh, stands for sentence. Uh, the tree may, may or, not, or may not be binary, depending on the parser or grammar that you are using. And the, the inner nodes represent uh, constituents of the sentence, part of the sentence, uh, parts of the sentence. They are labels labeled by symbols called non-terminal symbols, like this MP and VP here. And these non-terminal symbols stand for uh, the types of possible parts that you have in a sentence, like noun phrase, verb phrase, adverbial phrase, a prepositional phrase, and so on. The leaf nodes of the tree uh, correspond to lexical items. Lexical items are words, okay, correspond to words, but they could be labeled with the words themselves or with part of uh, speech tags, okay, or with both. And these lexical items are called uh, terminal symbols. Okay, so non-terminals are the symbols for the non-leaf nodes. Terminals are the symbols for the leaf nodes. And a definition that will be important late, later, we will say that we have a unary branch when we have a constituent with a single child. So for example, here in this example, uh, the left MP has a single child, which is NMP, right? This is a unary branch, while, for example, the right MP has two children, so it's not a unary branch. Right, so let's see how, how can we represent this tree as a sequence of labels, one per word. Right, so suppose that uh, we have uh, strings of, of a given length, W, and we have a set uh, of trees with W leaves and without unary branches. So here is where the unary branch uh, concept comes up. Okay? Uh, our goal will be to define an encoding function that assigns to each element of this set of trees a, a sequence of W labels. Okay, So to each tree, we assign a sequence of, of uh, labels, one label per word. You might be wondering, but why without unary branches? In real life, trees can have unary branches like this one, right? We will deal with them later, okay? For simplicity, we will define first the encoding without that, and then we will see how we deal with that. 
Right, so the encoding, uh, the first encoding that we are going to see uh, for to represent the constituent tree as a sequence of labels is as follows. And we will see later an example which will be clearer, but the definition is like this. Uh, we assign to the tree a, sequ a sequence of uh, W labels where the ith label, the label of the ith word, is a tuple NICI, such that the NI is the number of common ancestors in the tree between that word, the ith word, and the i plus one word. Okay, so the number of nodes in the tree that are ancestors of both, that are above both. Okay, and ci is the label of the non-terminal symbol corresponding to, to the lowest common ancestor. So let, let's see it better with an example. Here you have an example. They dine with the king of Spain. And here we, you have the representation as one label per word with this encoding that we call the absolute constituent encoding. Uh, so you see that, for example, the label for the word they is one S. Why? Because it's the uh, number of common ancestors between they and bind, okay, between the current and next word. What ancestors do they have in common? Only this one, only the S, okay, because then it's a word goes its own way. So they have one, hence the one. And what is the lowest common ancestor that they have in common? The S, okay, so the label is one S. And similarly, for example, the label of width is 3PP. Why? Uh, this comes from the num number of common ancestors between width and the, which is three, okay? They have in common the S, the VP, and the PP, okay? And uh, the lowest common ancestor is the PP. So as you can see, we, we encode the tree by assigning uh, these labels, which are trivial to obtain from the structure of the tree itself, okay? Uh, and this is um, an injective encoding, okay? Every tree has an encoding, different trees have different encodings. There is a proof for that, but I'm not, not going to go into the, the details, but uh, it's, uh, it's injective and you can reverse it. You can encode and decode. Uh, the problem, of this uh, first encoding is that it's very sparse. It generates a lot of infrequent labels. It generates a long tail of infrequent labels. Uh, and this means that in practice, when you have to learn to train a neural network, for example, to uh, tag with these labels, the model will be hard to learn. Uh, this sparsity comes from the fact that if you have a, a very deep trees, you can have a large number of common ancestors, and then you will have labels with large numbers. So this generates a, a big set of labels. So in order to improve this, we define a relative encoding, uh, and the idea of the relative encoding is very, very easy. Uh, the idea is the following. Um, for each... Um, for each label, so the idea is the same as in the absolute encoding, but for each label apart from the first, instead of representing directly the number of common ancestors between the current word and the next, right? We represent it as the difference at the as the delta from the previous value. So let me show it with an example. Here you have again the same tree for they dine with the king of Spain. Uh, on top, you have the absolute encoding, and at the bottom, you have the relative encoding. So it's totally uh, easy, okay? Once you have uh, uh, the, rel the absolute encoding in the relative encoding, what we just do is subtract the value of each tag from the previous. So uh, in, in the label for dined, instead of two, we have plus one, okay? Because it's one more than the previous tag. In width, again, we have uh, plus one. In the, we have plus two, okay, because it's five minus three. And in king, you, we have minus one, okay, because we have four common ancestors and we used to have five, okay? So it's a, a very easy trick, right? It's just representing differences instead of the absolute number of common ancestors. But uh, it, it's what makes the encoding actually work in practice because it greatly reduces sparsity. Because in real life trees, typically you can have very deep trees, but you will not commonly find 
big jumps in the name uh, in the number of common ancestors, right? Most practical trees look a bit like this, where you uh, gradually go deeper. You don't uh, suddenly go from a world with uh, like two ancestors to one with ten, right? So uh, that's that's why the encoding reduces uh, sparsity, it generates uh, smaller tax sets in practice. Right. So now we know two two ways, two different ways of encoding a, a constituent tree in two labels. So once we know how to encode a tree, how do we make this work for parsing? How do we create a parser with this uh, knowledge? Right. So what we need is a tree bank. A tree bank is a corpus of trees, right? A collection of syntactic trees that have been uh, annotated, have been analyzed by humans, right? So we take our uh, tree bank, our corpus with gold trees, and we encode it, okay? So with that, we will get encoded sequences like this for each of the gold trees, right? With that, we can train a sequence labeling system, any of the shelf sequence labeling system. And we will get a system that given an input sequence generates tags like those. Okay, uh, and uh, once we have uh, once we have that, okay, um, the system will generate encoded parse trees, right? That we need to decode into uh, into the actual parse trees to obtain the parse trees. Okay. So uh, as you can see, we have turned any of the shelf sequence labeling system into a, into a parser. Okay, with, but we need to know how to encode, which we already covered, but also how to decode, because our sequence labeling systems is going to show uh, sequences of uh, labels, and we need to be able to obtain the tree. Uh, so, well, this is uh, a slide about. Um, how to encode, which is uh, trivial, as I told you, it's just uh, traversing the tree. And for each word, we analyze the tree. We see how many common ancestors uh, the word has with the next one. And we create a label with that number and the uh, name of the lowest common ancestor. So here it would be 1S, 2BP, and so on. OK, this is uh, quite trivial. The last word has no next word to compute the lowest common ancestor. So it is assigned an empty label, okay? So actually we need uh, M, if we have M words, we only need M minus one labels to represent the, the constituency tree. Okay, the, the last word needs no label. Is how to encode with the absolute encoding. With the relative encoding, we just make the subtractions as I told you before, okay? But the more, the more interesting thing, how do we decode? Okay, suppose that we have uh, this sentence. We have run a part of speech tagger to, uh, to obtain already the grammatical category of each word. So we have the full lexical items here. And then we run our sequence labeler to get the uh, representation of the tree as a, as a set of, uh, as a sequence of labels, one per word. Okay. And now from that, we need to obtain the actual uh, tree. How do we do it? Well, we process the labels from left to right in the following way. For example, for the first word, day, the label is 1S. That means that it has one common ancestor with the next word and it's labeled S. So we draw it, okay? We create this part of the tree. Then we get dined to VP. Then it has two common ancestors with the next word. The first one, must be yes, okay, because we already got it from the previous step. So we add the uh, VP, okay, and we draw this part of the tree. Then the same with width, with width we have uh, three ancestors, so we add PP, and then comes something more interesting. Now we have a five, okay, we have a label with five MP. What is this label telling us? That between Da and King, we have five common ancestors, and the last is labeled v, uh, MP. Okay, so we can draw something like this, but we don't know what the fourth common ancestor is. 
We know the first three because we found out with the previous labels. We know the fifth, but we don't know the fourth. That is clarified later because then we see king and it has four common ancestors with the. So then the fourth ancestor of king is necessarily uh, an MP. Okay, and we can draw that part. And then we apply uh, the same to uh, off. And then finally, for the last label, for the last word, we don't have a label. But we know that we can link it to this chain here, because remember that the previous label, 5PP, makes reference uh, to the common ancestors of both of and spade, in this case, of both uh, of, uh, of the two last words. So we can create that link there. Okay? So this is the way in which we decode. We traverse from left to right, and we start drawing the tree with the information that we get in the in the labels. This has some limitations, namely uh, the, the tagger, once we train a, a sequence labeler to do this, it could generate any sequence of labels, but not all the sequences of labels encodes uh, valid trees. Okay, In the example that I gave you, it does. It's, uh, the coding works perfectly because the sequence represents uh, a valid tree. But this is not always the case. For example, imagine that here in this uh, state, okay, where we don't know what node is in the question mark, imagine that instead of having a 4MP as the next uh, label, we had 5MP. Then the unknown would remain there. Okay? We would never know what this ancestor is. Okay, or We would have a, a, tree, a, a node with an unknown non-terminance. And the opposite could also happen. We could have too much information that is contradictory. Here you have an example. If, if we have labels 1A and 1B, then these uh, words have a common ancestor, but one label is saying that it's uh, labeled as A, and the other one says it, it's a B, so which it is, there's a, a contradiction. Okay? Uh, formally speaking, this happens because the encoded functions are total and injective, but they are not surjective. So there can be sequences of labels that do not really come from any tree. Uh, and what's the solution in practice when we find this? Well, we apply simple heuristics. Okay? So for example, if, if, uh, we if we get an unknown non terminal, we just remove it from the tree and link its children to its uh, parent. If we get contradictory non-terminals, we just choose one of the alternatives. Maybe we can trust the, the first alternative, the last alternative, whatever. Uh, simple heuristics. This might sound crude. This might sound unsophisticated. But remember that one point of uh, parsing a sequence labeling was uh, making the process efficient, Okay, because previous approaches were uh, slow. So can you create more elaborate heuristics that will be more accurate? Probably. Do you want to? Probably not. Okay, because we want here we want to to get maximum efficiency. If what you need is maximum accuracy and you don't care about efficiency, you wouldn't be using this. Okay, you would use a more traditional parsing algorithm. So that's why we use uh, these simple heuristics. Then another limitation. We assume trees without unary branches. Uh, we did this because these encodings cannot represent unary branches directly because we don't have enough information in the labels to uh, know the labels of all the known terminals. So here you have an example. For this tree, we only have one label, the label of W1. And this label will tell us that W1 and W2 have a common ancestor, which is an S but they don't tell us anything about A, B, and D here. The C and E are known because they are given by the part of speech tagger, okay? But we don't know what A, B, and D are. Uh, the, so the, the underlying problem is that when there are unary, unary branches, we have more non-terminals and labels. So it's impossible to represent all the non-terminals with the labels. Uh, so how do we fix this? Well, this is, there is a standard solution for this, which is not from... I mean, it doesn't come from parsing a sequence labeling. It's used also in other uh, parsers. It's a, a traditional solution, which is to collapse the unary chain. So when we see a chain like this, A, B, C, a unary branch A, B, C, we change it to a artificial non-terminal symbol A plus B plus C. Okay, And this way, we only have to guess one, uh, one symbol, and we uh, 
uh, sidestep the problem. Uh, right, so now that we know how to create a parser with this, uh, what architecture do we, do we use? We can use any sequence labeling architecture from pre-neural, like hidden Markov models, although in this case we will get low accuracy because um, these uh, representations generate uh, quite large and complex taxes, so uh, hidden Markov models and the likes of them might uh, fall short. By LSTMs, bidirectional LSTMs work uh, very well and fast, and uh, language models based on transformers like BERT and Roberta, which are models that generate vector representations of words considering the context, okay, considering the surrounding uh, words, uh, work even better, although they are slower than bidirectional LSTMs. Here is an example implementation with a bio STM. There's really nothing much to, uh, to see here because it's just a, a standard implementation of a bio STM to label a sequence of words. So for each word, you obtain a pre trained vector. Okay, you obtain a, a word vector. You pass it through a layer of bidirectional LSTMs and then you pass it through a multi layer perceptron with a softmax layer that gives you your, your label. Okay. But for this, you don't really need to know this. You just download a, a sequence labeling system and, and run it, okay? Uh, and this is uh, the performance with uh, different uh, architectures on a standard uh, benchmark on the English Pen Tree Bank. So as you can see, if we only use a multi-layer perceptron, this F1 score is the standard accuracy metric for constituency parsing. If we only use a multilayer perceptron accuracy, it's not good, it's 77.2, right? But with file STMs, it's 90.8, uh, which is uh, rather good, okay? Worse than state, of, I mean, state of the art for this is around 95. So neither of these is uh, state of the art accuracy, but they are much faster than uh, state of the art parsers because we are talking about processing. Uh, more than 800 uh, sentences per second on a standard uh, GPU, right? So this is really fast. It can uh, parse El Quixote de la Mancha in, in like 15 seconds. Okay, so it's uh, for large scale processing, you sacrifice a little bit of accuracy, but you gain a lot of, uh, of speed. Right, so this was for constituency par parsing. What happens with dependency parsing? Uh, sorry. In dependency parsing, uh, the structure of the sentence is represented as binary relations between words called dependencies that go from a, a head or parent node to a child node. Typically, we have the restriction that each word has only at most one parent, so at most one incoming arrow, and that there are no cycles. And in general, we enforce them. I mean, this depends on the specific syntactic theory, but in general, they must be trees. It is, this kind of graphs of dependencies must be trees. The advantages of this representation over constituents is that it's closer to semantics. You don't need intermediate non-terminal nodes, which makes parsing easier. And especially it's less anglocentric because it's more flexible to languages with uh, free word order. So it's easier to create uh, multilingual uh, systems. Uh, one important concept for dependency parsing that is going to be relevant is the concept of projectivity. We see that um, uh, sorry, in, in dependency parsing, the projection of a word is a set formed by that word its children, the, the children of its children, and so on. Okay, so a word and all its uh, descendants, right? And we say that a dependency tree is projective if given any word in the tree, its projection, so the set of it and its descendants, is always a continuous substring, like, like here, okay? And we see that a tree, uh, we say that a tree is non projective if there are words for uh, which the projection is not a continuous substring, it's discontinuous, it has some gap. Okay, so for example, here, and he gave a talk yesterday about parsing, uh, about parsing depends on talk, but yesterday doesn't. Okay, so there is a gap. Non-projectivity can also be identified uh, because we have dependencies at cross. When we 
uh, draw them graphically above the words. So uh, why is this relevant? Because uh, projective parsing, when we don't support crossing dependencies, is simpler and more efficient. And for some languages, like for example, English, non-projectivity is actually rare. So uh, often we use parsers that analyze only projective sentences. Although if we want to be truly multilingual, we need to deal with non-projectivity. Right, so <laughs> once we have said this, how do we encode dependency trees as sequences of labels? Where here you see as a first example, the, the simplest encoding that we have is what we call the naive relative encoding, where uh, what we do is for each word, we have a label that encodes the position, the, the relative position of, of its head. So for example, for the word Vinken here, we have a label plus two, meaning that its head, its parent is two positions to the right, okay? And from the word board, we have minus three, meaning that the parent is three positions to the left, okay? So we have plus X, X positions to the right, uh, minus x expositions to the left. And in addition, we also uh, um, encode the kind of dependency. So Vinken is a, a nominal subject. So we, uh, the complete label is plus two comma nominal subject. Okay, it's a tuple. This encoding supports non-projectivity, supports crossing dependencies. But the problem again is that there is a lot of sparsity because in real life there can be large uh, long distance dependencies. So we could get labels like plus 24, minus 32, and we get a large set of uh, labels making the encoding hard to learn. So one way to uh, alleviate this is to um, change this encoding to a relative part of speech based encoding, where what we do is the following. Instead of, for example, the tag of board, the label of board having a minus three because the head is three positions to the left, right? We have a minus one verb, meaning that the head is the first verb to the left, okay? So we are going to count only verbs and the label is the first verb to the left, which is join in this case, okay? And similarly, Vinken has a label plus one verb, right? Meaning that the, its head is the first verb to the right. Uh, so this is also a non-projective encoding and it's less sparse than the previous, basically because we will get smaller numbers in general. The problem of this is that uh, for this to work well, we need to have good part of speech tags, which is not al always that easy, okay? It depends on the language and of the kind of data that uh, we have to train a, a part of speech tagger. So a more robust solution that works almost always uh, quite well is what we call the bracketing encoding. So in the basic bracketing encoding, what we do is the following. For each right dependency, for each arrow that goes to the right, we represent it by adding a slash symbol to the um, origin word and a greater than symbol or a right arrow, if you want, to the destination word, okay? And for each left dependency, we represent it with a backslash symbol at the origin word and a um, left arrow at the destination word, okay? So as you see, this leads to labels that are composed of several characters. So for example, here, the label of the word join has two slashes and two backslashes because there are four incoming dependencies from the word uh, join, okay? There is a way to, to do the decoding of this with a stack. And uh, this is a quite balanced solution because the sparsity is uh, quite manageable, especially with some extra technical modifications that I'm not going to show here that uh, reduce the sparsity. And also we don't need part of speech tags here. Okay, so we don't care about having bad or no part of speech tags. Uh, the problem is that this encoding only supports projective trees. It's that it doesn't support crossing arcs because suppose that we want to encode this tree, for example, which has uh, crossing dependencies, what would happen that uh, we would decode a different tree? Why? Because there is an ambiguity. How do we know that this, um, that the, the outgoing arc from half goes to today 
and the outgoing arc from, from class goes to parsing as opposed uh, to the outgoing arc from half going to uh, class, for example, and, and another arc going to parsing. There is an ambiguity, okay? When, when we have crossing dependencies, the encoding is not enough to, to specify the tree. Uh, there is a way to fix this, which is um, uh, an extension of the encoding where you have, you divide the uh, dependency tree into planes, call it a red plane and a blue plane, okay? In such a way that blue dependencies cannot cross other blue dependencies, red dependencies cannot cross other red dependencies, but blue dependencies can cross red dependencies, okay? So you are basically splitting the tree into two subtrees that are projective, okay? Uh, and then you have red symbols and blue symbols, okay? So for each symbol, you have a red version and a blue version. So with this, uh, you can do that the, the coding with two stacks, one per color, and uh, you have a bracketing encoding that can support the crossing arcs. It's a, it's a quite uh, dirty trick, but it works, okay? Uh, so these are the main encodings I wanted to talk about. There are also some encodings uh, based on converting other parsers, transition-based parsers, which are parsers based on state machines into sequence labeling, but I'm not going to go into, into that. Okay? So once that we know how to encode dependency trees and to decode them, again, we can build a parser. Uh, for that, we need a, a sequence labeling system, that, which can be an off-the-shelf system. And we need uh, a decoder that decodes the label back into a tree. Again, as in, as in constituency parsing, we could use pre neural architectures, we could use vial SDMs, or we could use uh, contextualized uh, word vector models like BERT or Roberta. Here you have an, a, an example of an implementation with vial SDMs. It's basically the same idea that we saw for uh, constituency parsing. Uh, maybe the difference is that here we are uh, passing as an input to the LSTM not only word vectors, but also part of speech tag vectors and character vectors. But this, I mean, you can implement it in various ways. It, it doesn't have to be necessarily like this. Okay, it's just an example. In, in this example, we have two layers of bidirectional LSTMs and a final fit forward that produces the, the label. Or you could use BERT a model, a transformer-based model like BERT that gives you contextualized uh, vector encodings for each word that, uh, that you then give directly to a feedforward network to generate the labels. And here in this example, there is something interesting. Note that our labels are always tuples that have several components. So instead of predicting the whole label as an atomic entity, you can predict the separate parts of the label using multitask uh, learning, okay? So you use several uh, feedforward layer, layers and with, with each of them, you predict one part of the label. With this, you also reduce uh, sparsity and it tends to work better in practice than just predicting an atomic label, okay? Uh, how do you do the, the decoding? How do you go from sequences of labels to trees. It's very simple, it's practically trivial, okay? Simpler than in constituency parsing because uh, for example, with the relative encoding, you just follow the numbers to find the head. So a label has minus two, it means that you have to create a dependency uh, from uh, two positions for, uh, to, the, to the right, right? So you just follow the numbers. There's nothing much else to do. But again, the problem is that uh, there might be sequences of labels that do not uh, correspond to a valid tree. This, in these cases, could happen to, uh, for several reasons, okay? One, because of indexes out of bounds, for example, suppose that uh, you have a label with a minus five, but there is no word in that position, then uh, it's, a, it's not well specified what's the head of that word. Or uh, you could generate a cycle. Maybe in word one, you have label minus one, and in word two, you have label plus one. So you would have a dependency from one to two and another dependency from two to one, which is illegal because that's not a tree, okay? There is a cycle. Again, as before, the solution is simple heuristics. For example, 
a dependency you uh, is not uh, correct because uh, the head does not exist or, or because a cycle would be created well just ignore it don't create it okay uh, a, no a node remains unconnected to the tree just link it to some default head okay? so uh, the idea is to have very simple heuristics so as not to affect efficiency uh, how does this work here you can see a comparison for english uh, the three last lines are the three encodings that we uh, saw here the, uh, the the relative encoding uh, the post act based encoding and the bracketing encoding the uas is a, a standard measure of dependency parsing accuracy which measures the uh, the proportion of words that got their correct head in the tree and the LAS measures the proportion of words that got the correct head and also the correct dependency type. So here for English, the uh, part of speech tagging based encoding is the best with an UAS of almost 94, which is uh, rather good. The state of the art is currently around 96, uh, 97, okay? Uh, but here, here is an... Um, some results by the way with this is with uh, by lstms with BERT, you get uh, already more than than that okay uh, so the, this example could make you think that the post post -act based encoding the parts of uh, speech based encoding is the best but uh, at, at the beginning in fact we thought that okay because in the first experiments we did we got this result and then, then we found out that that's uh, almost only the case for english because in english it's very uh, easy to get good part of speech tags, both because English itself is easy to analyze and because of the wealth of data. But on a multilingual setting, like you can see in this other slide, so this rel pause here is the part of speech tag based encoding, and you see that brackets, which is the bracketing encoding, is better almost almost always. Okay, it's consistently better because when when your part of speech tags are not that great the bracketing encoding is is better okay the rest of the encodings that you can see here are other encodings that uh, that i have not talked about because uh, there is quite a, a variety of them okay? but in general the bracketing encoding is the uh, one that works best uh, and here you can see a comparison of uh, sequence labeling system about uh, against the other two dominant parsing paradigms, which are uh, in yellow, the graph-based parsing, and in red, the transition-based parser uh, parsing, where in blue circles, you have sequence labeling parsers. In the y-axis, you have accuracy, and on the x-axis, you have speed in tokens per second. So what you can see basically is that sequence labeling parsing is behind in accuracy, a bit behind, but it's uh, much faster, especially on CPU. Okay, on CPU is uh, twice as, as fast as other alternatives. On GPU is well considerably faster, although not uh, not twice as fast. Okay, this was a comparison from 2021. But also notice that uh, right now, uh, by using better language models in our architecture, the accuracy gap is considerably uh, smaller than this. Okay, right, right now the accuracy gap is only about one point so just to conclude because i think i'm already slightly over time uh well some more developments that i haven't talked about uh, we, uh there are dynamic encodings for constituent parsing which are basically combinations of several encodings there are also encodings for discontinuous constituent parsing which is a more complicated grammatical theory where a constituent can has uh, can have gaps inside there are parsers that can uh, apply multitask learning to get constituency and dependency trees at the same time okay which is an advantage because with other parsing uh, formalisms you cannot do that okay with other methods and uh, also algorithms that use uh, external data like for example human gaze data for multitask learning and uh, in the case of constituency parsing, there is also a, an encoding that is not ours. It was released by some uh, Kitai Van Klein for, from Berkeley University, which has the property of being bounded size. It has a, a fixed number of, 
uh, labels uh, regardless of the length of the sentence. So as a conclusion, I have presented parsing as sequence labeling. It's a general method for parsing that is considerably faster than other approaches, both because it's simpler and because it's uh, easier to parallelize because each label can be computed in par parallel. Apart from this, it has a lower barrier to entry because you don't need ad hoc algorithms. You can parse with standard sequence labeling libraries and it's easily pluggable because you can, uh, it gives you an output in the form of labels that you can decode to a tree if you want, but you can also not decode them and directly plug them into the next uh, step on your pipeline. You can give it to another NLP task. It supports both uh, main uh, parsing formalisms, the tendency and constituent parsing, and the accuracy lags a bit between behind the stat, uh, state of the art, but uh, the gap is closing, okay, thanks to better language models and better encoding. So I think uh, it's a quite uh, useful method in the sense that you get speed and simplicity at the cost of some accuracy, but not too much, okay? So uh, this is all. There are some references there, just in case uh, someone wants to consult uh, <laughs> the papers he finds in the encodings. And uh, that's all from my side. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot for the very nice talk. And now it's time for questions from the audience. So feel free to write your name as usual in the chat, and I leave you the turn to speak. So. Time for questions. Let me see if I can see the chat. OK, yes, I think. Yeah. Any question? I lost, lost the slides, though, but. Uh, well, in the meanwhile, I can ask you a few things, Carlos, if it's OK. Sure. If you go to a slide 42, and yeah, let me, because I did something here wrong and I lost the slides, but let me try to, yeah, I'm sure. going to stop sharing and maybe share again. Sure, sure. Uh, right. Uh, here they are. What, what slide did you say? Uh, 42. 42, I mean, this one, yeah. okay. This is a, a very minor um question in any case, but Spanish is not in there. Is there a reason for that? Is just a coincidence or I don't know? Yeah, well, it's a it's a good question. I think the, the reason for that is that uh, uh, here we are using corpora from universal dependencies, which is a data set that has a lot of languages. It has more than 100, in fact. And Spanish is one of them, so we could have used it. But in general, when you do a, a multilingual evaluation, uh, what you want to try to do is to have diverse languages, languages from very diverse uh, families. Uh, so in this case, for example, we already have English as an Indo-European language, and you typically cannot get away without using English because everyone wants to see results on English. So that's the reason why we didn't use uh, Spanish. We added like a a Sinitic uh, language, Finnish, Finnish, which I think is an isolate, a Slavic language, and so on. And uh, so we didn't have to look for, <laughs> yeah, sure. for Spanish, but, although we do have other other papers where we use it as well. Yeah. And in fact, as I can see in this slide as well, Tamil, the worst results by far are obtained with Tamil languages. Tamil yes. language. It, this is like this because you have uh, fewer examples to train with, or this is related with the fact that is by some reason a more complex language. I, I don't know. In this case, it's ma mainly the first reason because, uh, uh, yeah, in general there are two two big factors for a language being easier or harder to parse. One is the language itself. For example, uh, fixed word order languages like English are especially easy. And uh, agglutinative languages like Turkish, for example, tend to be especially hard. But the other factor is the size of the data set. And in this case, this is a dominant factor. The Tamil data set is quite small, so that, that's, the, that's the main reason. Yeah. And related with this, in case, well, I'm here, I don't know, asking everything, but please feel free to write your name in the chat. 
because otherwise I will continue with this conversation with Carlos. Um, because as you know, this is not is it's not that it's not my main field of research. The fact is that it's not related at all with my uh, research. So I'm very curious and interested on this. Um, how large are these linguistic data sets? This uh, corpus, how, how large they are usually? Yeah, so uh, typically um, they are in the range of uh, maybe 10, uh, tens of thousands of tokens and for in the best cases for the languages with most resor uh, resources maybe hundreds of thousands of tokens for english for example you have hundreds of thousands for others you can you have tens of thousands and for the worst ones for the uh, low resource languages some sometimes you only have like for example 1000 sentences which would be maybe 1,000 sentences can be 20,000 tokens or, or something okay. like that. And or these, even 100. Yeah. I mean, it depends a lot on the language and on the yeah. uh, on whether there was people and funding to create a larger data set or not. Okay. Well, my last question, and I, and I give the turn to Rocio, uh, who is willing to ask a question. Uh, and all these data sets are manually annotated. Manually annotated. Uh, well, that's also a good question. Mo most of them... Uh, I mean, all of them are manually annotated in the sense that at least a human validated the the, the final result. Some of them are semi-automatic in the sense that they were first obtained by a parser and then a human goes and fixes the output. In fact, there is a, a standard procedure to generate uh, this kind of uh, data sets, which is called bootstrapping which consists in the following. You, for example, uh, uh, get a, uh, so a human analyzes, for example, I don't know, 50 sentences, right? Totally by hand. Then with those 50 sentences, you train a first parser, which is going to be very bad because your data set is, is very small. With that parser, you parse 50 new sentences, and then the human goes and fixes the, the trees, okay? which will be work because the output is going to be bad, but less work than starting from scratch. Then you take those 50 new trees, put them together with the initial 50, train another parser, which will be better, and parse 100 new sentences, and then you fix them and so on. That's called bootstrapping. So uh, there are parsers that are fully manually annotated from scratch and others that are created by uh, either bootstrapping or just, uh, for example, uh, running a parser trained in a different corpus and then fixing it manually. But all of them had, uh, have at least undergone manual check. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. So now, Rocio, whenever you want. Hi there. Thank you, Carlos, Hello. for your presentation. It was really interesting. It is it's, uh this topic is more related to me than to Pablo. Um, I, I'm in the same uh, slide as you are, and uh, you said you needed um, different uh, type of languages, like uh, English and Spanish could be similar somehow. Um, could it be safe to say that uh, if you had, instead of English, something closer like German, maybe the uh, accuracy you obtain could be more or less the same. Is there any way of transfer learning to apply here? So you, you mean uh, you mean if I if instead of English I have used German, or you mean if I train the system on English and both. then run it on German? Okay. I'm asking both things. <laughs> yeah. So about the about the first question, uh, Ger German has. Uh, more flexible word order, word order than English. So in general, I would expect uh, lower accuracies. There are a lot of factors involved in, in this thing. So uh, we typically tend to, uh, so we try to get languages from diverse families to show that our system uh, can work across language families. But that doesn't mean that within the same language families, they can, there cannot be differences. There are also differences both due to data set size and to characteristics of the language. So for example, English and German come from the same family, but the mm -hmm. syntax is not really the same. So I would expect German 
in general to, to have worse accuracy. About transfer learning, uh, yes, uh, you can uh, train on a language and parse on another. In fact, this is quite standard where uh, when you don't have annotated data for a given language, like, uh, you, you uh, try to take a similar language and use it to train the system. In fact, for example, uh, at uh, my university, we, we developed a tree bank from, uh, for Galician. And one of the things that we did to do that was to start with uh, pa a parser trained with uh, Spanish and Portuguese, which are close to, to Galicia. So with that, we obtained a very rough parse trees that then, that then uh, of course, a human uh, corrected and fixed uh, for Galicia. So yes, uh, transfer, transfer learning is uh, applied, and especially if, if the languages are related, both in terms of family and having similar vocabulary and so on, you will get decent results, OK? And uh, you can try maybe I, I'm looking at the Tamil there that has very low accuracy. Um, if you did not have Tamil at all and you wanted to do transfer learning from another language, could you perhaps compare them to see if uh, I know where to transfer from? I don't have any idea <laughs> with Tamil, but uh, maybe if you, for instance, let's say English, and you transfer to Tamil, and you have also the data set from Tamil, can you compare them or integrate both somehow? Like, I don't have as much information about Tamil, but I can join what I have with transfer learning from another. Yes, yes, uh, that's also done. So it, it's possible to, for example, to do transfer learning from two languages instead of one, as I, as I told you that we did for Galician from both Spanish and Portuguese. So we trained a system with both uh, Spanish and Portuguese at the same time. And it's also possible, of course, if you do have some data in the target language, uh, but not a lot, uh, yes, it's possible to, for example, get the Tamil uh, tree bank and extend it by adding English sentences and if the Tamil tree bank is uh, small, as is the case here, you will probably get um, an improvement from doing that. If the tree bank of your ta target language is good enough, then not, because you will be um, introducing noise. Mm -hmm. But for low resource languages where you have very little data, it's typically useful to do that. That's really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the question and the answer. Any other question? The last one, because we, it's time to finish this seminar. No. Well, okay. if you want, we can, we can stop here. Thank you very much for the talk, Carlos. I, I think and I hope that it was interesting and useful for all of us. And thank you very much again for your for your participation, for accepting our invitation. Hey, th thanks a lot. It has been a pleasure to be here. And yes, I hope uh, I hope it was interesting. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's keep in touch. Bye-bye. Okay. See you all. See you.